thank you. And uh, let's just bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God, for bringing us together this morning to worship you in song and to worship you around your word, in the proclamation of your word. And Lord, I ask for your enabling. I pray that you would speak through me, that you would give us ears to hear, and Lord, that you would fill our hearts with desire to walk in obedience and the wisdom to know we must trust you uh, for the enabling. And Lord, we just set ourselves apart unto you right now and ask you to have your way in our hearts. Cause us as a church to be conformed to the plan and purpose that you have for your church. And may we see that revealed to us in the scriptures this morning. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We thank each of you who have been leading us already this morning and uh, this day of prayer for the persecuted church. Um, recognizing that uh, the church in Thessalonica was a severely persecuted church. It began, was birthed in persecution, and many of the principles we are going to see in this passage uh, are principles that are essential to uh, the strengthening, the nourishing of a church and enabling it to, to thrive in uh, hard places. It was close to a hundred years ago that uh, Dale Carnegie wrote a book, became a classic, titled How to Win Friends and Influence People. Today it's still one of the best-selling books on that topic. I read that book when I was 18 years old, and I reread it and read it again probably four or five times. It was one of the most impactful and influential books I have ever read. As I was studying this passage on Thessalonians this morning, um, or this week rather, I was reminded that I should probably pull out that book and read it again. Um, in the book, the author lists six uh, key principles for winning friends. And all six principles in that book are very biblical. I would highly recommend the book. Um, I've had my kids reading it. The first principle is to become genuinely interested in others. The sixth principle is to uh, make the other person feel important and to do it sincerely. These two principles are prominent in this letter to the Thessalonians. As you read this letter, it's clear that the men writing this letter are very genuinely interested in these Thessalonian Christians and they make the believers feel very important. Principles that come from the heart of God. And when Paul, Silas, and Timothy, who are writing this letter to the Thessalonians, came as missionaries to the Macedonian city of Thessalonica in modern-day Greece, they faithfully proclaimed the gospel to many in that city, and soon they had established a church. But the enemy of God stirred up strong opposition to these Christians, and their faith um, was opposed. They dragged some of the believers uh, to the courts and brought them uh, false accusations. The courts passed some unspecified but serious charges against, or judgment rather against them, which involved taking security from some of the, the Christians and passing a threatening order that we aren't told what exactly was this order, but it resulted in uh, the Christians urgently sending Paul, Silas, and Timothy out of the city in the middle of the night. And apparently an extended period of strong opposition um, and persecution continued from that time on against the Thessalonian Christians who were all new in their faith. While the three missionaries moved on down the road, 
to the cities of Berea and then uh, Athens. Thessalonians is a copy of two letters that God inspired these missionaries to write to the believers that they left behind in Thessalonica. So let's, let's look at uh, where we left off from last week. Chapter 2, verse 17. They write, But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Speaking to the believers as brethren, uh, brethren is a term expressing family relationship. We've seen that throughout this letter. The missionaries write about the experience, what it was like being sent away from the city um, by order of the courts, and they describe it as being taken away from the Thessalonian believers. In English, we miss some of the uh, emphasis behind that phrase. The Greek word that is translated as the phrase taken away uh, is a word which describes the painful and traumatic experience of parents who are forcibly separated from their children so that the children are left as orphans. So this expression being taken away, being torn away from you, emphasizes that it was a forced unnatural and agonizing separation. And they say that they are apart in presence, but not in heart, which simply means you're out of our sight, but not out of our minds. We think about you all the time. And then they go on to write, we endeavored more eagerly to see your face with great desire. Or another translation says, we tried very hard to come back because of our intense longing to see you again. And the desires weren't only those uh, of these three men, but the next chapter in verse 6 of chapter 3 indicates that the Thessalonian Christians themselves greatly desired to be united with the missionaries as well. And all of these sentiments... This desire and this longing to be together and the grieving over having been torn apart are the expressions of a healthy Christian love. And the longing for togetherness is the expression of what God intended to be the desire for relationship with one another as the church family. God has put these desires for fellowship, for togetherness, for relationship into his people. Many of you are separated by distance from loved ones. Our daughter, Katie, has been studying in the States. She's out of sight, but not out of heart. Many of you, you know from experience that what that's like. We are often texting phoning, video chatting with each other, and these times of contact are always highlights in our day. And we eagerly look forward to being together again, face to face. Why? Because we're family. We love each other. And that is the way God created a healthy family to relate and to feel towards one another. It's important to notice that this is the way God has created his church family and intends us to relate to one another. If we don't have these yearnings and longings for time together with one another in the church family, it is a sign that there's something wrong in our relationship. If you find it easy to skip out on gatherings of the church family, I would rather be somewhere else there's something unhealthy going on in your heart. If you drag your heels in coming and can't wait for the gathering to end so you can leave, that's a symptom of spiritual sickness. It's a very good and natural thing for believers to want to hang out for a long time after the meetings just so they can connect with the rest of the family. I love it when an hour after the service, the foyer is still full with people who just don't want to say goodbye just yet. That's the way it should be. 
It's like when you get together with family and you know uh, the family together time is short and you see the hour drawing near where you have to say goodbye and you just linger and you linger and you want to drag it out to the last minute. That's a healthy sign. That's a good sign. And then verse 18 says, Therefore we wanted to come to you. Even I, Paul, time and again, I wanted to be together with you. I longed for that fellowship with you. Time, time again, but Satan hindered us. Satan knows that God intends for the church family to be together. Satan knows that. And he knows that God has purpose in the family being together. Satan knows that it strengthens the members of the church when they gather and build one another up in the faith. Satan knows that it is healthy for the church to regularly spend time together in ministry, worship, fellowship, so he opposes it. Satan knows that if he can cut off or at least minimize the contact believers have with other healthy believers, that he can weaken or even destroy their spiritual health. You can't read this passage that we're focusing on today and conclude that it's not important to gather together as a church family. You can't read this passage and conclude that it's God's will for you to just practice your faith on your own. You can't come to the conclusion from the Bible that you don't need the church family. God has created us with the need to be together. And Paul says, we wanted to come to you. Time and again, we tried, but Satan hindered us. This wasn't just a, a vague uh, desire and conversation that we, we need to do this again. We need to get together again. It would be nice to get together, but no, they made plans and they put forth an effort, not just once, but repeatedly again and again. They planned and they tried, but all their plans and efforts were frustrated by Satan. Satan is the one who works to keep the church apart from one another. Satan will make you too busy to get together. Is one of the biggest obstacles we encounter in trying to build relationship in the church. People are too busy, or you just can't get schedules to synchronize, or the enemy will speak lies into your mind, telling you that it's not that important, or that it's a waste of time, got other things that we need to do, or that other person doesn't really seem interested Maybe he or she has something against me. So you, you feel awkward in trying to get together. This is the work of the enemy. The text says Satan has hindered us. That English word hindered is a translation of a Greek military term, which means to stop the advance of the enemy's armies by tearing up the road, destroying the bridge, or barricading the pass so that they are hindered from carrying on. When Paul says Satan hindered us, he's using warfare terminology intentionally. The battle is over the souls of men and women. And it is Satan and his army of demons who seek to uh, keep the church powerless by keeping the church apart and too busy to be able to encourage and strengthen and build one another up in our faith. And when you do get together... He works hard to keep the conversation light, to keep you from talking about the things that will really help one another grow. He works to keep your encounters ineffective and unfruitful. Verse 18 teaches us that Satan's power is formidable, formidable enough to stop the ministry of Christians, even men like Paul, Silas, and Timothy, They were prevented from getting together, at least temporarily. There's another scripture that talks about this preventing work of Satan. In Daniel chapter 9, we read that 
a demonic being was able to hinder an angel of God for three weeks, keeping him from delivering a message to Daniel. But for three weeks, Daniel persisted in prayer until Michael, one of the chief angels, was sent by God to help the other angel get through to Daniel with his message. And prayer is such a vital key to victory in our spiritual battles. Pray for unity. Pray for the bringing together. Pray for the holding together. Pray for those that, that are, are drifting. Pray for those that are on the fringes. Pray for those that you see the enemy working to, to distance. Though Satan is powerful, his power is limited. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 Verses 10 to 11 indicate that when these three men encountered the spiritual opposition, they prayed. They prayed night and day against this opposition. They prayed night and day that they might reconnect with the Thessalonian believers. We need to learn to pray night and and day, if necessary, against the work of the enemy. The Bible says we are to resist the devil. And we resist him primarily through prayer. The Bible tells us that these three eventually were able to reconnect. Uh, and in large part, because of their many prayers, the Thessalonian church survived and thrived and grew in spite of Satan's opposition. We've already, we've already seen that in our past studies, how this church was just thriving and spreading the gospel everywhere. Satan's power is limited, but it is real and it can be very destructive, especially against a prayerless church. We are not to fear him, for greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. But we are to take him seriously because he is capable of and does destroy the lives of those who are vulnerable. And being isolated from the church family makes you very vulnerable. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. The Bible says, be sober-minded, be watchful. And that word watchful implies prayerful, watching and praying your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Lions and wolves and other predatory animals, uh, we all know from the National Geographic videos and so on who they prey on. They look for the stragglers. They target those that are separated from the rest of the herd or the flock. The sheep that goes astray or who cuts themselves off from the church fellowship is in great danger of being devoured by Satan and should be the focus of the church's prayer and the focus of the church's outreach. Those that are on the fringes, those that are straggling, those that are outside. And this can be difficult to do because often those on the outside are for a variety of reasons angry, bitter towards the church and they make it difficult to love them and to pray for them. But we must recognize that this anger and this bitterness is part of the enemy's opposition and the enemy's dividing and separating that he might devour. The enemy's attack includes flooding minds with all kinds of lies about they don't love me, they don't care for me, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. They're not real. As I was meditating on this passage, I was convicted how I often fail to let the love of Christ be expressed through me towards those who most need it. It's easy to love those who love you. It's easy to love those who like you and what you're doing. It's hard to love those who brush you off. I often believe the lies myself. They don't like me, so why should I like them? 
They don't want me. So I'll leave them alone. But after studying this passage, I prayed, Lord, make this my prayer ongoing. I make this my desire ongoing that the Lord would change my heart and cause these next two verses to increasingly describe my attitude towards our church family. What are the next two verses? Verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. You're our joy. They're, they're saying, they're writing to the Thessalonians. You people are our joy. You're our hope. You're our, our crown of glory. Rejoicing. Like good parents who delight in their kids, these, these three church shepherds found great joy in the present and, and hope for the future in these believers, these men and women who are deeply loved. Paul, Silas, and Timothy loved the church family, and they longed to be together. And their greatest joy was not in material things. It was not in riches or in great accomplishments. Their greatest joy wasn't in exciting entertainment. Their joy was in the people. And their joy was especially in influencing those people who were once enemies of God and children of Satan in such a way that they had become part of the church. That filled them with joy. To think of this person and this one and this one and this one who was, was an enemy of God. And now they're a brother in Christ. And they lived with the expectation that Christ would return soon. And they could hardly wait to be able to stand together with these new believers in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ and present them to the Lord. That filled them with joyful anticipation and hope. They looked forward to this. That is going to be such an exciting time. I want you all to be there. Don't want any missing. As parents, you want to stand before the Lord and present your children, all of them, to the Lord with not one missing. And if there is one in danger of missing, oh, let us get every resource available to us praying and reaching out and standing with us and letting, let us not rest from praying day and night until there are none missing. What is our hope? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Our hope is that you will be together with us in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. What is this talking about? Look at some of the key words for clues that will give us insight into this. Let's start with the crown of rejoicing. He's writing to, to Greeks and in Greek culture, um, a wreath was made of woven leaves. They called it a crown, and it was placed upon the head of someone who is, was being honored for exceptional accomplishment or service. If you, if you see some of the Greek sculptures or, or Greek coins, um, Greek art, you often see uh, this person with a wreath, uh, a laurel wreath usually around their head. What was this among the Greeks? That was a sign that this person had been crowned, had been honored for some great accomplishment. 
Military generals, when they returned from victory, were crowned with this, with this wreath. Uh, athletes, when they, when they won uh, their con- athletic contest, they were crowned with this, with this wreath. The crown was their glory. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 and 25, the Bible says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? Who's, who's writing? The Corinthians were Greeks. They all know, talking about the races, they all run, but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. That's the prize. But we, for an imperishable crown. An imperishable crown. Something eternal a reward that is going to last and last and last forever. Also in the Greek culture, when someone received a crown for their victory, frequently they would then dedicate uh, their crown to uh, their God whom they acknowledged had helped them or who they wanted to credit as being the one who helped empower them to, to this achievement. And they would set the crown before this, this idol of their God in their God's temple. Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. In light of this background is interesting. The 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever and they cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. And that is the joy that these apostles were looking forward to. One day being able to set before the Lord these believers the fruit of their ministry and to present them before the Lord and say, Lord, you are worthy of all the glory. You have done it. Giving God the praise. And they looked forward to that. The future return of Christ when rewards and crowns are going to be handed out. And and the Bible says much about these rewards. The believers who are the fruit of their ministry are in some way going to be their reward. And the apostles are going to present this joyfully to Christ. Think of your children whom you've led to Christ, discipled, the joy of presenting them to the Lord. Or imagine presenting to Jesus your friends who were once enemies of God, colleagues who once cursed his name, lost neighbors who had nothing to do with him. One day the joy of being able to stand with them before Christ and present them to the Lord. Those of you who have interceded and prayed for others, they will be your crown. Those who taught them the basics of the faith, those who opened up your home in hospitality, welcoming others to come in and experience what it's like to be part of the family of God, those who served in tangible expressions of love with your hands and with your time to minister to others, those you served will be your crown. Those who are influenced through your service, there will be great joy when you, together with those you loved and served, stand before the Lord. And you can cast your crowns, present these people. First Thessalonians chapter 3. Therefore, when we could no longer endure it, meaning we, we could no longer endure the, the emotional pain of forced separation from you. We could no longer endure the opposition of Satan that kept frustrating our attempts to be together. 
When we could no longer endure it, we, that's Paul and Silas, thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith that no one should be taken by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. Whatever the enemy was doing to block them from returning was not letting up. But they were able to get Timothy through on his own. Timothy got through, snuck through the the lines that the enemy had established, the, the blockade that the enemy had erected. Timothy was young, probably still, almost certainly still a teenager, This was his first solo ministry trip, and he slipped through. Satan meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. You see, Satan wasn't able to resist God. God was using this, and God was going to work through this. The grace of God. We trust the grace of God. When the enemy erects barriers, God raises up a standard of righteousness. What an amazing opportunity for this young rookie missionary to be able to go and to see God use him to play a key role in a great sovereign move of God like he discovered going on when he came to the believers in Thessalonica and he was able to have a key part in that, encouraging them, strengthening them, building them up. There was great opposition to the gospel going on in Thessalonica and the enemy was preventing Paul and Silas from helping out but God was demonstrating that he has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty that no flesh should glory in his presence. Satan thought that he was succeeding in keeping them apart. But God brought Timothy through. The strategies and the work of Satan would fail. God's work would carry on in unexpected ways. So God used young Timothy to establish and encourage the believers, building them up and strengthening them in their faith. Timothy was young. And the Bible tells us that he had been studying the scriptures since he was a child, learning the scriptures. And he was anointed by the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. And he was able to teach and disciple these new believers. Let us as a church never, ever underestimate what God can do through our young people. Let us pray for them, encourage them. Invest into them and give them opportunity. Notice verse 3. Part of Timothy's task in going to these people was to build them up, encourage them in their faith so that they would not be shaken or turned away from their faith by the, the afflictions coming from the opposition. He was, he was not to teach them some form of prosperity doctrine telling them you just need to have enough faith and you'll be delivered from any experience of affliction and suffering. That wasn't the mission from God. He was to strengthen their faith so that they might endure the affliction triumphantly. Verse 3 concludes with this statement, for you yourselves know, was writing to the Thessalonians, Thessalonians, young, new Christian Thessalonians, you yourselves know that we are appointed to this, appointed to experience afflictions. They knew this because part of the the basic elementary teaching that the apostles had taught these new believers before they were driven out of the city was that as Christians, you are called to suffer. As Jesus suffered 
so we are called to take up our cross and follow him. Suffering persecution for their faith was not understood as an extraordinary event, but it was understood as that which, to, that which they were called to or destined for. This is the promise given to the church in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. The Bible says, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And this is not speaking prophetically of a period of persecution which will pass and the, and the church will return to life as usual. Life as usual for the Christian is persecution. Do you realize, as you study history, particularly church history, the relative freedom from opposition that we Christians have experienced for decades now in the Western world has been abnormal compared to the experience of Christians in the rest of the world throughout most of church history. The normal is opposition to the gospel. But in accordance with Bible prophecy, we in the West too are returning to a period of growing opposition to Christ and the Christian faith. I'm just going to read some excerpts from um, November 1st, a uh, report that came out online, uh, CTV News. Uh, Stephen Harper's former director of communications has joined the outspoken criticism of conservative leader Andrew Scheer, saying that Scheer's position of having a moral and personal problem with gay marriage and his refusal to march in a gay pride, gay pride parade could be fatal to his future of actually being successful in ever being elected to be the prime minister of this country. He thinks that Scheer's lack of support for the LGBT community is a deal stopper because such a position is overwhelmingly viewed by Canadians as bigotry. You can't come any closer to saying if you're a Christian, it's a deal stopper to ever being president in this country. And where does that go? We need to recognize where we are headed. Our emphasis this morning on praying for the persecuted church and realizing that we are moving as a nation closer to that category this is not something that should alarm a Bible-believing Christian who understands the prophecies of God's word. Verse 4, 1 Thessalonians 3. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened. And you know... For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. Here again, we see these three missionaries were well aware of the capabilities of their enemy. Here in verse 5, Satan is referred to as the tempter. Satan brings opposition against the church, striking fear into the hearts of the believers, and then he tempts the believers to deny their faith, to defect back into the world side and escape the conflict. Paul knew that this was going to be the real test of these Thessalonian Christians. It would be the real test of the genuineness of their faith. He had heard the profession of their mouth. He had baptized them in water. But now came the real test to expose what was in their hearts. He knew that anyone could make a profession of faith with their mouths, especially if friends and family are also making that profession. But what do they do when there is opposition to their faith and the tempter strikes with great enticing temptations to walk away from it? 
The real evidence of genuine saving faith is that it perseveres under the pressure of opposition and temptation to return to the world. Increasingly, the church in our Western world is going to be put to this test. How will we respond to the increased persecution and increased temptation to compromise or completely abandon the faith? Many will pass the test, but the Bible predicts that many will fall away. As these three missionary men knew, a key to coming victoriously through the time of opposition and temptation is for new and weak believers to have strong and close family-like relationship with strong believers who can pray for them, who can strengthen them, who can encourage them, who are accountable and able to ask the questions that need to be asked and and probe and, and to gather around them. Let us trust God to cultivate such relationships among us as the family of God so that when Christ returns, none will be missing, so that when the tempter comes, none will be enticed to to walk away and abandon. But with great joy and rejoicing, may we have the hope of all standing together in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ casting our crowns before him and acknowledging, Lord, it was by your grace that we have come. It is by your grace that we are here. Your grace has accomplished it all. Let that be our anticipation. Let that be our joy together. And how fitting and appropriate that We are not yet dismissing, but we are going to go downstairs and enjoy a meal together. Heavenly Father, we know that this is hard. We know opposition is difficult to resist the temptation to just shut up and deny that I'm one of them is great. It's hard, Lord, to love some with whom we have difference. It's hard to love those that are hurting when they just lash out. It's hard to reach out to those who are embittered against you. But Lord God, I pray that the challenge, the daunting challenge would drive us to the realization that apart from the grace of God, we are without hope. But that through Christ, we can do all things. Oh Lord God, how do I love the way you loved? I can't, but you can. How do I reach out to those that are unlovely. I can't, but you can. How do I resist the temptation of the enemy and how do I stand firm in times of persecution? Lord, in my flesh, I cannot, but praise God, you have filled me with your Holy Spirit and it is your life in me that is the hope of glory. It is your life in us that will give us the victory. You will do it, Lord, as we yield to you, as we trust in you, as we offer ourselves to you and say, take me, use me. Enable us, Lord, to walk in obedience to your spirit's prompting. And Lord God, on that day when you return, to you will go all the glory. To you will be all the praise. And Lord, I pray that there would be none of us missing. I pray that you would motivate parents to gather others to join with us in praying for our lost children, in praying for our wayward children. Lord, this is not a time to have a stiff upper lip and go it alone. This is the time to cry out and recognize apart from the intervention of God, there is no hope. 
Lord, cause us to be a people that recognize where our hope lies. Our hope is in the Lord. And cause us to be a people that recognize you have given us the church and we need the church. We need one another. For it is through the church that you work and we need you, Lord God. We need your working. And we ask you, Lord, to work in this church and to work through this church for the glory of God. Cause us to pray one for another and cause us to fellowship with one another. And Lord, may part of our praying be that we would love one another more and that we would be sensitive to one another's needs and reach out to those in need. And Lord, let that begin as we gather around tables in the fellowship hall this morning. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. I pray for this congregation in the name of Jesus. So be it, Lord. So be it. That means amen. Yeah. <laughs>